Welcome, dear viewers. Welcome to Art Talk, the place where we agree to disagree. Today's topic is compassion. Quite timely, I think, looking at the world out there at the current state. My guest joins me from Berlin, Germany, and it is Gerald Blumeyer. Hello, Gerald. Hi, Rene. I don't want to disagree about compassion. <laughs> and if we do disagree, then uh, we do it with a lot of empathy. Okay, excellent, <laughs> excellent. I will open my heart all the way. Uh, you are a really surprising discovery for me because even now, before we started the filming, you took me by surprise by already bringing up something which I had in my mind without me having said a word. Well, all I can say is, uh, obviously, we've never met personally. We've spoken a few times, um, uh, uh, you know, in this um, via Zoom and... Uh, but it's uh, it's interesting that we seem to get on well together. It's a, it's a real discovery to me, and it's a great honor. I'd like to introduce you uh, to my viewers, um, Gerald. But before I do this, um, dear viewers, yesterday I made um, a small test filming with Gerald. I do this with my guests to check out lights and, and technical stuff. And uh, Gerald immediately started to tell me something about um, his take of compassion. And um, I interrupted him very, very rudely because I don't want to discuss these things prior our very spontaneous conversation, which we are having now. And um, Gerald, I took the liberty of... Um, actually transcribing and translating into English what you said yesterday um, or started to talk about. And I would like to introduce you now and then pick it up where you left it. For that purpose, I would like to have your permission to um, share what you said and um, share with my viewers the translation when you started to talk you can think about it for a while, while I give my viewers um, a few uh, data about you to introduce you. As you can tell, dear viewers, we don't know each other very well. Actually, we started to communicate about three weeks ago. Uh, and uh, in preparation of this um, conversation today, I went on to Gerald's website um, to introduce him to you. And I have to say that I found a very colorful, rich life described on Gerald's um, uh, website. A very self-determined man uh, is presenting himself there. So I cannot do justice with the few things I picked out. And I recommend you go and read for yourself. Um, you will find the website of Gerald's in the description of the video. So what I did pick out is the following. Gerald Blomeyer is of German-English um, descent, born in London into a diplomat's family. And at the tender age of 15, he returned to Germany, where he uh, studied architecture. In 1970, Gerald had his first direct contact with Buddhist philosophy, even meeting the Dalai Lama back then already in 1970. In 1984, his son Fritz was born. Uh, throughout that decade, the 80s, plus minus, Gerald was busy as a university lecturer, a publisher, and a filmmaker. He started studying meditation in earnest during that period and also got in contact with Reiki. By the time of the German reunification, that is 89-90, Gerald had been lecturing about city planning in more than 20 countries internationally. In 1991, Gerald meets his second wife, Eva Etta Bush, with whom he deepened his spiritual unfolding. 
15 years later, Eva got ill with cancer. She passed away at home in 2005 after a time of intensive care. For his grieving process, Gerald left for India where he stayed for eight years teaching and studying Buddhism. He is back in Berlin since 2014 teaching meditation. He is also a coach, a consultant to corporations, and notably, a sought-after storyteller with his podcasts. So, uh, Gerald, is this more or less okay? Would you like to add something? And following this, may I quote you from what you said yesterday? You may do whatever you like, René. It sounds perfect. Very <laughs> flattering. Thank you. I, I, um, I thank you for your trust. Uh, dear viewers, um, this is what Gerald said yesterday, and I interrupted him so rudely. Have a look. If we were to talk about Reiki, there are two sides for me, Gerald said. There is a Reiki that I came to know where, for the first time in my life, I felt that all the parts of me were assembled next to each other. And where and when I decided this is what I want to learn. Then I practiced Reiki for several years, many treatments, until I became a Reiki master in 1991. A symbol workshop with Focke Brink followed, and Focke introduced me to Eva Etta Bush. That was the love of my life. When we talk about compassion, there are two kinds. First of all, the normal compassion, which I knew up to that point, and then one that came afterwards through this woman. She opened my heart and the flow of love, and that is a different state. So, Gerald, that's exactly where I would like to pick up, um, where I interrupted you rudely, and you were about to explain, and this is, I have two issues on my mind, and one was exactly this, the love, uh, that two type of um, compassion, that was is one of the things which keeps my uh, heart and my mind busy for the last few weeks. So you preempted it yesterday, and I was very happy about it. And I'd like you to continue where I interrupted you yesterday. It is, it is, it's always a question of opening your heart. And your compassion to look after other people is always very nice and you can be very charitable. But the idea that you you overflow with love, that means that something special has happened in your life. And if I Eta opened my heart in a manner that I always introduced her, not as if I Eta, but this is the love of my life because she opened me in this fantastic way. We had the feeling that when we came together, we were connected with the universe. We, I had three years of difficulty being in her presence without having a, a tunnel vision, or as they say, seeing everything through pink glasses. It was amazing. And this has kept uh, throughout my life since then. I have kept this open heart. And it is, it is a, a different way of looking at things. I, I really, uh, I have a teacher, he's the Dalai Lama, and uh, one of the things that he says is, um, home is where the people love you. And so meeting Ifa Eta was like coming home. But practicing Reiki was also like coming home, and practicing Buddhism was also like coming home. And I have the feeling, René, that because this meant something to you, you have, a, you have a personal experience that you would like to share with us. <laughs> um, thank you. Um, that's a great opening because, as I mentioned, something occupied my mind. 
Um, the people who know me will uh, know that emails, I mostly, practically always uh, end by saying with love or just love and my name. So the concept of love um, has been, um, if you want, like the overruling um, principle in, in, in my, lay, my life. And if I talk uh, about life, uh, love, actually, you know, the, the person back here uh, whom you see a little bit, he's representing, he's on the cover of my book, which I wrote many years ago. And that book is about the quest of the true meaning of love. And um, for me, that was like the governing principle. And then more recently, I started to feel, wait a minute, and it, maybe to be more precise, if I talk about love, I'm not now um, referring to uh, what one might um, uh, interpret or define as erotic love between man and woman. Um, I'm referring to what one might refer to as uh, unconditional love, um, what the Greeks call agapi. Um, they have different terms for the word love. And um, what recently in connection with um, the situation in the Ukraine and Russia, um, I felt like maybe love isn't the, the, the concept. Maybe it is compassion. And uh, I started to ask myself, what is the difference between compassion and, uh, and love? And uh, that was the question in my mind when you entered my life, Gerald, and started to basically uh, answer this question or address this question um, with what you said. So this is, this is really where I am uh, at to, to, to answer your question. Do you get what I mean, where I am oh, at? Of course. No, of course, of course. But you see, if you take your life where it started, when you were in the womb of a person, you experienced love and compassion. This is the basis of your being. Without the love of your mother, you wouldn't be here without her caring for you. And this is really the basis of our life. And this is what we can say, our job in life is to help other people and to, to support them on their way. I, I'm with you and uh, the, you addressed me and you said when you, Renee, were in the womb of your mother and I, yeah. I'm fully with you. And the yeah. same thing is true for every other human being on this planet. This is it, this is it. And and uh, that's the, you're now touching exactly at the point where my thinking started. Yeah. How about people who do evil? How about people who kill other people? Uh, as you know, uh, our talks about, are about Reiki also uh, uh, and about reconciliation. So these things, particularly the reconciliation process where transgressions happen, and the worst thing on the planet probably is uh, genocide is is rape of people. There are hideous crimes out there committed by human beings who, like you said, were once in the womb of their mothers and and were um, maybe already then not experiencing what they, in my opinion, were entitled to by definition of creation. And that is the entitlement of being in that compassionate environment. Um, so for the moment, uh, let's, let's just take this conversation from here. Um, how do I deal with, with, you know, I found it difficult to get in touch with unconditional love for um, certain people out there and uh, rather than taking current figures, let me go back in history and take w one man, Adolf Hitler, who stands uh, for many of us as the impersonation of so much bad being done. And I found myself, how can I, how can I truly get to the place 
of heart of hearts where I am uh, feeling unconditional love for a person like that. And that's precisely the, the juncture where I ask myself, maybe maybe I'm, I'm harping down the wrong path. Maybe um, the right thing to think about is compassion. You know, so I'd like you help me. Uh, how do I how do I find compassion um, in my heart in my quest for for people who intellectually, spiritually, and emotionally, I profoundly am convinced that even the worst of the worst deserves that I get to that point in me where I am unconditionally loving that person. Uh, where I'm feeling uh, compassion. Um, and also, what's the difference between empathy and compassion? Please. <laughs> well, there's a lot of questions. So um, from Hitler to you to all these things, well, it's fascinating. Um, from my point of view, I think the Dalai Lama summed it up very nicely when he said, George Bush is a very nice man, but I don't like his politics. So you see, you can differentiate between what the people do and saying, this is what they are. This is what you're saying. If you look at all forms of life, you will love all forms of life unconditionally and equally. And then people do bad things. So you have to say, you're doing something bad. You have to draw a line and you have to say, this will not be tolerated. We do not want this. We do not want a war in the Ukraine. We want peace and we want you to talk to one another and you see the problem with the evil is always when you think that things are happening on the outside if you believe that happiness comes from the outside then you will believe that power will give you more possibilities to take over more happiness be more powerful be more whatever but certainly not be more compassionate the, the, the key to all of this is, in my mind, seeing that on the basis, we are one. And this is where Reiki comes in because it says universal life energy. What is life energy? What is the difference between love and life energy? And I think when you, when you go onto that level, you will say, I have to tolerate it. So the Dalai Lama says, you should look at your enemies as very special teachers. You can never learn patience if somebody doesn't annoy you. <laughs> somebody has to press the buttons. And you have to be clear about what you want. And every time something unjust happens, you're forced to react. You're forced to say, I do not want war. I am going to do everything in my possibilities to say, I don't want it. I'm going to send the people love so that they really realize what the basis of love is all about. And to understand that they too have been through the process of being loved. And power is of course always a great distraction because it puts you in, in a position to um, manipulate people. Yeah, I, uh, I'm with you. Um... Yet, uh, it's one thing to say, I uh, like George Bush, I dislike his politics, and I disagree with him. Um, I would find it very difficult to say, I like Adolf Hitler, uh, but I don't like his politics. There is, there is like, and I'm pushing my point, I know that. Um, and personally, I had an experience in Germany. Uh, 15 years ago, uh, we, there was I was invited as a guest of honor. Um, my Reiki students invited me, um, and we were a wonderful circle of spiritually interested, if not in, on the process in the process of awakening. Uh, wonderful people around me, and uh, conversation was flowing freely. And uh, I don't know how, but um, we came to the point of reconciliation we came to the point of how everyone and there are no exceptions um deserves ultimately to um be reconciled with so this was sort of loftily flying in the air and i was in germany so it wasn't very polite but it 
popped out of my mouth. I said, so ladies, if the door would open now and Adolf Hitler walked in, would we welcome him at our table? And so, so you know, um, while in principle, all these, all these um, teachings um, uh, are fine and, and, and wonderful, I cannot help but, and I'm talking about myself, you return the ball to me, I cannot help but um, delving deeply into the dilemma, the paradox in me, and I'm not able to resolve it at all times. Well, it's very yeah. simple. We have a local prison, and there's a big sign on the outside, would you say good morning to a person who murdered someone else? Yes. Okay, so then you have your answer. You will say good morning to every person. And this is the level of meeting a person on the level of life and things. It is not saying I really appreciate the fact that you murdered someone, but it's saying as a person, as a life, as a, a living being, I respect you. And I think the Tibetans who were imprisoned in, in China, they, they, some of them said they were so worried. And um, when asked why they were worried, they said that we would lose the compassion for the people who were keeping us locked up because we want to respect them on this level. And if we don't respect them, then we're not all inclusive. Yes, I, I agree. Um, I, I'm fully with you. And um, yeah. <clears throat> so let's, let's go back to your Hitler. Um, you say... I love everybody in the world, and then Hitler comes in, except you. This doesn't make sense. None. No, it doesn't make sense because you're saying, I don't love you. You've done things wrong. You've, you've got to be, you know, you've, we've got to discuss this and say this is right or this is wrong. But you can't say, I'm, I'm not going to love you, I, I, if you ask me. Um, I'm quite amazed by the amount of people who did love Hitler, if you see the films. It's amazing because he speaks with a completely different language, body language and intensity, and, and the people reacted very positively. When he lost the war, nobody was a fan of his. That was amazing. But he was carried, you see, and if you take Mao Zedong, Mao Zedong was another charismatic leader, and um, Somehow charismatic leaders must have had a past life or if there are past lives where they've done something good because otherwise they wouldn't be able to um, affect so many people. These are mass movements. But I think, you know, going back to the Ukraine, we have to be quite clear. We do not tolerate this. We do not want war. And we can only say every person who's part of a military machine must be quite clear that they are doing something really unjust and they're responsible for their actions. This is something we have to say. So what we can do is we can send good energy into these areas and we can ask that, you know, open our hearts and say, we're going to share the loving energy with this. You know, in Germany, people have gone crazy. It's as though they, they've forgotten what they were thinking about two weeks ago. You know, they said, we, we don't want to have a very strong army. Now they're saying, oh, we do want to have a very strong army. Oh, oh and, and what, about, what about all the poison that we're using in, 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 on, in, on, our, on our land? What are our farmers using? Oh, yes, well, we have to use the poison now, too, because, you know, now we're investing in the military. It's as though Germany is running through a sort of temporary amnesia. <laughs> uh... Yeah, um, you, you know, um, the, the difference between compassion and empathy and, okay. and, in, term, and in term and the word uh, mitgefühl would be rather empathy and um, uh, compassion would be rather mitleid, at least according to I some of the... Disagree. Some, I disagree. I well, disagree totally. Well, Hold on, hold on, hold on. Let's we'll talk about your disagreement. Okay. Um, but but the, the, uh, what I was striving at was because I at yeah. heart of heart also disagree with that. Um, so 
but but I looked it up and and um, compassion is defined in um, the dictionary, for example, as um, also uh, pregnant with a desire to alleviate things. Yes. Yes. So Help. it is. It is, a, it is a call for action, whereas yeah. in empathy, um, this call for action is actually not in the foreground. So yeah. maybe maybe these are subtle differences, but yeah. not uh, and that's why I interrupted you yeah. because if, we, if we're talking about the current situation, I think the call for yeah. action, like you rightly say, that we yeah. the people get up and say, hey, we don't want this and that yeah. we take action like uh, and we are supporting um, uh, the, the weak, we are uh, the oppressed, uh, the people who have run away, um, we are opening a home for them and so on. So that's going into it, the action. Yeah. And yeah. that would be more within the definition of compassion. So, yeah. sorry, where did you disagree? <laughs> Empathy is feeling with someone. So. Rene has a stomach ache. Oh, I feel with you. I'm so sorry for you. That is what the Germans call mit light. And when you say mit Gefühl and you want to do something, you say, and I wish you that you get well quickly. So um, traditionally uh, in Buddhism, you say the nurses are uh, one of the main people who give a, a very empathetic and they feel with all the suffering of their patients that they're looking after and then they have a burnout because uh, they've given up all their strength. And this is where Buddhism says, no, you have to look after your, uh, only a full pot can pour. You have to look after yourself first and then you can help. And if you run empty, then you can't help anybody. If you have to be looked after because you looked after someone else, that's extremely impractical. And therefore, empathy is very good because we need to feel with people. What is Rene feeling now? That is very important. But that's not having compassion with you. Compassion with you, Rene is in a difficult situation and I, I'd like to help him and I'd like to alleviate um, the whole thing. And I think this is... Uh, this is really the key to say if you want to love and really open your heart you're always going to be on the level of loving kindness now there's one further difficult difference uh, or one further thing that we should look at in in buddhism they say the word love is extremely difficult because the word love usually has attachment if you have attachment it can't be pure love it can't be Therefore, they talk about loving kindness and compassion. And this is the level that you move on so that you don't get mixed up. I've just fallen in love with this beautiful being. And good Lord, this is not love. This is attachment. And so this is something we have to differentiate between what are we talking about? Where are your feelings? Are you with yourself? And I think one of the most important things is to say, if you want to love someone, you have to have a good relationship to yourself. If you want to be compassionate to people, you should be compassionate to yourself. Then people can believe you. Yeah, uh, this is exactly where for me the word uh, unconditional is, uh, is so important. Right. Yeah. Um, uh, and and at the end of the day, I don't think um, the labeling is uh, important, whether we call it this or that, or uh, I think the dynamics behind it also with the intention um, uh, which drives. Um, and I think the intention at the end of the day is rooted very strongly in uh, my Christian upbringing, would say the, the conscience uh, of, a, of a person. Um, and I give the benefit of the doubt to every human being on this planet um, to have access to that same source uh, or that same state, to use another word, uh, irrespective of their culture and their upbringing, which, of course, mm -hmm. will have an influence of how they deal <clears throat> with uh, uh, the, the, uh, that which 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 comes from that source okay okay i 
not quite sure where we should continue to go with this conversation because basically we agree and um, I, I think if we say well, spread as much compassion and love by taking care of others' well-being. I think that's a good motto for the day. We could always be happy with that. Uh, yes, uh, I agree with you. Um, and I do have an idea where we go with the conversation. The second issue, the second question I had in my mind, which revolves around the future, um, mm -hmm. and I have prepared a small video clip uh, okay. for us to, to talk about that. But um, just to complete, um, I found that this current crisis has triggered something in me which, which took me by surprise. I was always the first one uh, when Fukushima happened and a lot of things happened to mobilize a lot of Reiki people and spiritually inclined people and people who work with energy to, to do their thing, whether it's prayers or energetic work, whatever, mm -hmm. to help resolve um, for the unfolding of humanity, for world peace, for uh, the situation in Fukushima and so on. And the strange thing which occurred to me, this uh, Ukraine crisis did not trigger that in me. So um, it, and I was uh, taken aback by um, uh, an almost depressive kind of feeling of reflection because it, it, what I experienced in me and around me was not complying with my usual behavior, with my expectations. Mm -hmm. It triggered obviously something new and I, I needed to deal with that. I didn't, it was uncertain. And uh, I realized that for me to call, to jump into action and do something would not really meet the compassionate call for, for deep down um, take a position. Um, it would have been almost a, an escapism into activity. Okay. And, and I came to the conclusion that where I can contribute and what I find is very important is to uh, work towards the understanding that it is not the Ukraine, it is not Russia, it's not Germany, it's not Switzerland, it's actually all of us who are involved. And more relevantly, it's yeah. you, Gerald, and me, Rene, and every individual viewer who is, who is uh, behind his screen now. Yeah. It's, it's all of us, it's not them who need to make peace. Um, yes, uh, hopefully we can do everything and we need to call for action that a truce, that uh, the weapons are silenced as quickly as possible, of course. But that's like a, a short-term remedy. In the long term, something more profound is called for, and that is uh, um, to come to, the co to reflect the situation. What have I contributed to the current state? Um, what is my role in, in, in this community we call humanity, which includes everyone on this planet? So that's uh, because you asked me about my uh, process. Mm -hmm. That's what mm -hmm. I needed to add to. Do you to say that is a problem of being complacent? You, uh, took, compl peace. you took peace for granted. Um, complacency, overconsumption, these are uh, certainly uh, manifestations or symptoms of, of the process. And, uh, you know, the, the human nature who tends to take the easier way to, to become complacent and uh, be, be in contradiction with uh, very often in teaching circles, we are very often, we are preaching water and we are drinking wine. We are, we are in contradiction to our own teaching. And that's precisely what I found myself in. I didn't want to jump to a alibi um, exercise where I'm doing something like everybody I know must now be united to send Reiki out there to mm -hmm. Ukraine. Yeah. Yes, that is. there's nothing wrong with that. And I support all these groups and all these endeavors. But my process was 
where is complacency? Where, how can we break through these circles? And what can I contribute to, um, uh, to this insight that it affects each and every one of us um, and not the Ukrainian or the Russian people and their leaders? Okay, so what was your result? You're, you, you've said you've got parts and they need uh, reconciliation so that you can be René once again. And it, it's, it, this is the amazing thing. Uh, you're still René, you're still talking to me, and yet something has happened on the inside because something happened on the outside. And this shows how we're all interconnected. And this factor that you're saying, I think this is a deep thing that many people are confronted with, that we think we're living in a crazy world. But the question that you've just posed is, how do we reconciliate our values inside us? How do we live the love inside us towards these people? What is your job now? How are you going to make the world a better place? So have you any new plans? Or are you going to do the same as you did yesterday? Yeah, that's exactly the kind of question. So uh, to answer it directly, um, one of the things I wrote an article about that, so that's the mean I can do. Uh, I prepared this particular art talk and you just uh, gave a key word again, uh, uh, a better world was the words you used. Uh, and this, the next part and the video will touch on that. Um, and the other thing, uh, I did, my wife and I decided to uh, proactively uh, go and offer, uh, because that's something we can actively do, um, our flat uh, uh, for for refugees uh, from the uh, Ukraine, which need to run away. That just uh, is okay. the immediate things in okay. the outer world I can do as a result, and you correctly put it, from an inner process, from an inner, to put that turmoil at ease, there are many different ways to do that, but you yes. summarized with a, a healing or a reconciliation process, yeah. and that's yeah. perfect. Yeah. Well, I just wrote my blog about Leonard Cohen, oh. and he had this wonderful sentence or wrote a wonderful poem saying, there's a crack in everything. That's where the light comes through. So I think this is reflecting the situation that we're in. This is reflecting that you're finding, oh, the complacency is something that's breaking open now. There's something new coming. You have to look at it. I'm very happy that you're offering a flat to refugees. I think that's very kind of you. And I think, you know, we all are challenged to, to find what we can offer. But I don't think it's, uh, it's, I think it's really a challenge to, to reframe what everything is happening. I, I think, you know, you have to be clear. It's one of the, one of the things I really believe in is, and I think you do too, is liberation through reframing. Um, if we just say, oh, this is terrible and this is sad and oh, you know, woe to me and all, you're not helping anybody. You have to say, okay, let's sort that certain values have come to an end, certain things are filled. We know we need to approach things in a different way. It's time to wake up. Um, the many things that weren't there in the past, but now they're here. Let's do something new. And I think that's that's really good. But we have to reframe it. We don't have to look at the just look at the catastrophe. If we have to say this is unjust, this is something we have to stop. But now there are problems. There's a refugee coming to Switzerland and he can approach René. This is wonderful. Yeah, and that's uh, dealing on, on the, on the yeah. symptom level and, and what you're referring, uh, reframing, uh, is mm. a much deeper rooted um, causal level yeah. uh, to, yeah. to prevent that this is yeah. going to happen again. Because I profoundly believe that humanity is capable of reinventing itself, of evolution, uh, continuing a process of unfolding of consciousness. Um, and these are good keywords to look at the future. And that would be the second part. Should I show you what I prepared? Please do. Let's see. Now, um, uh, well, let's see the first part and then I'll stop. <laughs> 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 
Indeed, I am very, very happy and great honor uh, to talk one of my old friend and spiritual friend. So I really happy having this opportunity. Although physically, we say distance, but mentally, we always together. I always consider you as an elder spiritual brother. So, Gerald, of course, this is a teacher of yours, uh, the Dalai Lama, in conversation with Bishop Tutu, who to me was highly inspirational uh, because of the peace and reconciliation work he did in South Africa. I lived there, I lived for three mm -hmm. years in South Africa. And um, in fact, the two of them have appeared in a number of my uh, video works so far. And of course, Bishop Tutu passed away last December. And uh, I thought I bring the two of them in here. Um, uh, this is a recent, uh, maybe the last uh, filming between the two of them uh, last year in July. And uh, a little bit further on in the dialogue, and I'm going to show that um, they continue talking. Here we go. Um, they're the, the talking about the making of a film, which I believe you saw yesterday. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, and here we go. A meeting at Dharmasala, you mentioned as a believer of God. So you, after that, ready to go heaven. Uh, I am, according to Christianity, I am not a believer. So Dalai Lama uh, go something different place. <laughs> <laughs> it's a lovely this, is, thing. this is, and I will show the last uh, clip then mm. in a moment, but this to me is so inspirational. Two such different cultures um, it's highly inspirational, you know, they're not coming mm. from the usual quarters mm. of occidental backgrounds. Uh, so wise, such beacons for humanity, uh, talking to each other, laughing with each other, with each other like almost like children. So, um, of course, you'll met the Dalai Lama on more than one occasion. I don't know. Have you met Bishop Tutu also? No. I didn't meet him. But I can say both these men have had extremely difficult pasts. The Dalai Lama is a refugee or was a refugee and Tutu had many illnesses. And if you look at the suffering that they went through in their life, and then you will see it, they're inspirational because despite the suffering, they used it to reframe their view of the world and to open their hearts into love. And I think the word they use is joy and not just compassion. And if you take Buddha's um, Anapanasati Sutra, for instance, where you have the basis of mindfulness, you will find, I feel happiness, I feel joy. And this joy is something you have to keep going and you have to work on it. And if you want to help people, you have to have the joy and, and encourage the other people to enjoy their being as well. Yeah, and in fact, uh, of course, uh, Mikao Sui Sensei, uh, pretty much in his own words, mm -hmm. said the very mm -hmm. same thing that he yeah. he's developed a method or he rediscovered a method uh, in order for people to lead a happy life. Right. Yeah. But the happiness is inside. And the problem of our Western society is we think it's outside. And I think that is the basic reorientation that we need to do. And that's why I was very happy with what you said before when you said you think about the Ukraine, but you're not thinking about the outside at the moment, but you're thinking about what is happening on the inside? What cracks are appearing there? Where have you been complacent? And I think that shows um, 
that 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 you're a real human being, Renee, and I'm pleased to talk to you. <laughs> Same thing is true. I was just thinking, this is not about me. This is about you, Cheryl. Uh, people <laughs> know me to a great extent. They don't know you. Um, yeah. Tell me about your cracks, about your uh, dark moments, your uh, inner turmoils, if you still have any, or are you entirely enlightened? Well, um, I, I think uh, there's no such thing as totally enlightened. Everybody works continually, and enlightenment is a process that happens and happens and happens. I don't know uh, where it goes to because I haven't experienced it. But what I have experienced is the love of my life dying. And when she died, I went to India and Nepal for eight years. And I went into all sorts of situations that forced me to let go of my old thinking. My old thinking was I knew how Berlin worked. I knew what was right. And going into these countries where everything works totally different, where the people are totally different, the values seem may be from superficially similar, but everything is different. That is when I went through a huge process of letting go of good ideas, letting go of uh, conceptual well, world views, if you like, and to finding out what is there in the minute and what can I do here and now. And coming back was very interesting because I thought, oh, yeah, well, I've traveled now for eight years. So when I get back, I can go back to normal. But there is no normal. The society had changed. Everything had changed. And so I had to reinvent myself. Mm -hmm. And what I did was I went to America. I went to a big event called Wisdom 2.0 in San Francisco. And they were talking about the future of mindfulness. And the future of mindfulness was quite amazing because they say you cannot practice mindfulness without compassion. This was the basis of Google, of LinkedIn, of Starbucks, and everybody, everybody was saying this in the conference and said, we cannot just teach mindfulness. It would be very nice. The, uh, uh, the sharpshooters in the army will be able to hit their people more precisely, but that's not the way to love. That's not the way to a better world. We have to practice compassion. And I think that's good because this is something that I can teach now. And I say, well, you know, we have so many wonderful teachers who are saying exactly the same thing, whether it's Jack Cornfield or, or whoever. They're all pointing out this is the way to go. Open your heart. Open your heart. Open your heart, let the light shine in through the cracks that appear. And trust. Only if you have trust can you go stand up to all sorts of really difficult situations. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm glad Leonard Cohen, he's appeared also, the same thing, the crack and the light in a previous R talk. <laughs> Uh, I'm glad he reappeared. So if I may just go back to, uh, let me see that I do it technically correct this time. And I'd like to go a little bit further and just show another snippet here. I consider that person also, you see, mischievous person. <laughs> Unfortunately, that person is Christian. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, he's a Buddhist. <laughs> There's a question of um, how you think about your own death. That possibility. <laughs> Quite polite. Quite polite. <laughs> <laughs> well, he doesn't mind too much because there's the reincarnation. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful scenes. 
actually the uh, the translator um, um, Dalai Lama's translator commented and said there's a problem being a Buddhist monk and uh, being asked to dance because Buddhists are not allowed to dance and uh, this is part of one of their vows and so this is a, a dilemma that the Dalai Lama was in but he used it very quickly by just tickling uh, Desmond Tutu's chin and this is so nice because the, the mutual part I, and I think the word mischievous is wonderful. It's a BBC film, and I, I was really happy to see it. It's, um, I, I felt it's, it's somehow lighthearted. It, you know, it takes, uh, it, Buddhism is very serious, and Christianity is very serious, and here you have these two guys playing around, and that's fun. And I think this has something to do with life, and love has something to do w with the joy. I, I think the film is called Mission Joy or something like that. Wonderful, wonderful. I will uh, find it and put it in the description underneath uh, when, we release, uh, when we release this. Um, and uh, I agree with you so much. And um, there are so, so many uh, direct messages in those snippets and of, obviously in the film, uh, but, but so much subtlety, uh, so many messages yeah. uh, to humanity, um, be it the dance, be it how... Um, um, the Dalai Lama, His Holiness, is coping with his promise not to dance as part of being a monk, uh, and and how he coped with that—that uh, that he is not dogmatic, that he is surrendering to the situation in mutual trust. Very yeah. important word you brought up, um, Gerald. I'm extremely happy we took a little longer than usual. Um, maybe for the end, what's today when we have finished and. Uh, the rest of the day, what's your intention? Uh, how are you going to call, to answer the call of compassion? What are you going to do uh, this afternoon to express it? Work on my taxes. <laughs> they have to be done. And this is the part that I think is so important that we cannot, we cannot uh, just look at a spiritual life without doing the practical things. And, um, I don't think anybody really enjoys working on their taxes, but it has to be done. And I will do that this afternoon. And I will do it with a certain amount of joy because it shows you that my life has a foundation as well. I live in a really practical society that demands from me that my feet stand on the ground. And at the same time, I feel I can open my heart and I can go into different realms. So it's wonderful. Thank you for the question. May I return it? What are you going to do this afternoon? Uh, I'm going to speak to a Buddhist monk a little bit later on. <laughs> Sounds good. Um, I have promised my wife to go uh, for a walk because the sun is beautifully shining out there. Oh, beautiful. Uh, and uh, talking of taxes, I really don't like doing the accounting. Uh, but it gives me great joy to do it because I know my wife dislikes it even more. And um, uh, unfortunately, I haven't been um, necessitated to pay taxes the last few years because of a small income. And uh, But I can say that I find that very unfortunate because the one thing in the tax field which I really do enjoy is actually paying them. Wonderful, wonderful. Our society wouldn't work if nobody paid. Okay. <laughs> there you go. Uh, so, there you go. Thank, thank you so you. much for, for this conversation. I've really enjoyed it. And I wish you and the Art Talks all the very best in the world. And may you reach many people and may you have many insights. Thank you very much indeed. It was a pleasure having you. I'm saying goodbye to you. Thank you, uh, Gerald. I'm saying goodbye to you, uh, dear um, viewers. Uh, I hope you subscribe and see you soon in three weeks' time.